All right. Uh, my name is Jesus Quinones, and I work for an organization uh, in St. Louis, Missouri called Casa de Salud. It literally stands for House of Health. Um, and the organization aim is a 501c3 nonprofit healthcare organization. And it aims to provide uh, high quality medical and mental health services for the immigrant and refugee population in the St. Louis metropolitan area. In 2016, over 30 counties in the bi-state region of Missouri and Illinois, uh, we received patients from all of those 30 counties. Um, and we, we on average see around 400 or uh, actually conduct 400 to 500 medical examinations per month. Uh, so we're pretty busy. Um, the number of unique clinical patients last year was 2,135 and we're a staff of 20, uh, 20, 20 staff members. Um, the mission of CASA is also to facilitate access to the healthcare infrastructure. We know that we can't do all the work. That was what we learned from another clinic that was called La Clinica in St. Louis. That clinic closed due to many reasons and so CASA learned from those mistakes and worked uh, aimlessly at building relationships with other healthcare partners in the St. Louis region uh, in order to facilitate that access to healthcare. So what I mainly want to talk to you about today is how CASA has been able to uh, establish trust in the community and how we've been able to get people into primary care, specialty care services uh, throughout the years. Um, and so one of the reasons why CASA was uh, f founded um, in the St. Louis region was in partnership with St. Louis University. They donated a building for us and allowed us uh, to renovate the, the building and make it into a pretty and welcoming environment in the St. Louis region. And so uh, our doors are open to anyone. Um, the front desk, unlike many uh, healthcare providers, they don't have any of those glass doors that, you know, it's sort of a barrier. Hi, I'm here for, and you have to sort of scream through the hole and like, this is why I'm here. This is not HIPAA compliant at all. We removed this and it's a much easier environment for our front desk staff to communicate with our patients. So that one, was one strategic um, plan that we implemented. Our building is very colorful. Um, I brought a copy of our annual report. All these colors you can find in the building. Um, there are Spanish quotes uh, because originally CASA was founded uh, to meet the needs of the Hispanic and Latino community. We quickly found out that St. Louis is not just uh, populated by the Hispanic and Latino community. There's a lot of foreign born uh, population in the city and we actually have the International Institute of St. Louis which is responsible for bringing in immigrants and refugees to the city. Um, the other aspect I wanted to talk about today is the GIA program. So I oversee the GIA program and the GIA program uh, is a social work case management program that aids our clinical program. Uh, GIA actually stands for Guides for Understanding Information and Access and we operate in a uh, case management model and we aim to facilitate that access to the healthcare infrastructure both at the systems level and at the patient level. As many of the panelists have emphasized, it's really important to be part of the political process, but more importantly, the systems level process. And so my supervisors, our president and I, we focus on systems level access by building relationships with healthcare organizations in the St. Louis area uh, to ensure that there are referral pathways that we can use for our patients. Um, and also to overcome the unique barriers that our population faces due to their inability um, or lack of access to public uh, assistance programs, which is something that has been echoed around today. Um, our case managers, as you can tell, focus on the patient level advocacy and patient level access. So we do referral coordination, which simply means appointment setting. Um, when our patients come to CASA, we are able to provide our services contingent on our volunteer providers. So our clinical program is mainly only uh, staffed by volunteer providers. We have around 70 volunteer providers, uh, physicians, uh, internal medicine providers, specialty care providers, mental health providers, nutritionists, dietitians that provide services contingent on their availability. So when we are unable to meet their needs, we refer them externally. And that's what the GIA program does. Uh, in addition to appointment setting, we have appointment reminder systems such as letters, text messages, etc. Anything that we can do to reach our patients. Unlike other providers, we call our patients until they pick up. We call them up to five times and if we can't reach them, we'll drop, but if they come back to us, we will most certainly reopen that case. Um, our case managers engage in patient advocacy and navigation 
Um, I'm not sure if you're all familiar with the navigation programs that uh, cancer patients go through, um, such as breast care. They receive a navigator that will guide them throughout the whole process from screening to diagnostic to treatment. And that's what our case managers do. Um, and like I said, the majority of our patients, I would say around 80%, do not qualify for public assistance. Um, another strategic uh, model that we used to establish trust in the community was not to specifically ask at the front desk uh, if the patients have insurance status or documentation status. We simply do not ask. But then to echo what Dr. Geltman was talking about earlier, I do think it's very important that the case managers and the medical providers ask documentation status when it comes to financial assistance. Like I said, they don't qualify for any program, no Medicaid. Even if you're a resident, you have to be in Missouri for five years in order to qualify. We have to guide them through the financial assistance processes that have been established by um, all the healthcare organizations. All healthcare organizations in St. Louis and the St. Louis region are nonprofits. So in order to maintain those statuses, they have to have a community benefit program, which we call charity care but now they're sort of referring to them as financial assistance processes. And so our case managers have extensive experience on guiding our patients through that process, which, which is extremely lengthy. Some applications can be up to four pages long, sort of like you were applying for a mortgage. Um, you have to provide supporting documentation, bank statements, pay stubs, tax returns. If you don't file tax returns, you have to get a non-filing letter from the IRS which can take up to 30 to 90 days sometimes. Now it's tax season, so probably even longer. Um, so that's what our case managers do. Um, and an example of how this affects our patients is some patients that come to us with a symptomatic hernia, they're referred to a surgeon, they have to see the surgeon to confirm the hernia, and then let's go ahead and schedule you for surgery. Well, the majority of the healthcare organizations we work with, they require our patients to be pre-approved before they can schedule their medically necessary treatment. So ethics is another concern that we have to deal with. And this is the type of systems level and patient level advocacy that the GIA program engages in. Um, and lastly, we engage in health education. In the past, we coordinated many classes, but our outcomes were not significant. We're not a social service agency. We're a healthcare clinic. So we specialize on healthcare services. And so we moved into recently into an evidence-based approach of health education. And so we now coordinate a home visit program uh, to address chronic illnesses in our community. And primarily those are diabetes and hypertension. And so we're staffed with a team of community health workers or case manager. It really doesn't matter the name that we use uh, under the umbrella of case management. And briefly, if I have time, I wanted to sort of provide an example of what the home visit program looks like. We have a, a case manager acting as a community health worker um, that provides education on chronic illness management in the home uh, at the patient's convenience. And the community health worker is accompanied by a volunteer nurse. Uh, so there's a lot of availability that we have to match in order to provide these services. But the goal is to empower patients uh, using a patient-centered model. It's all about them. If we can't go to your home, then we're not going to schedule the home visit until you're ready. Throughout the program, they receive three home visits uh, during six months and monthly calls in between those visits. And at each home visit, they'll be receiving uh, specific interventions, which I'll be quickly covering. We develop tools, our own tools, following the literature to measure program efficacy. As I said, we're a 501c3, so we do have to report to our funders. Uh, but more importantly, we wanted to measure patient outcomes because if it's intervention is not working, we want to do something else. So we developed the CASA Salud Diabetes Curriculum. I'm going to skip the community health worker part. Because uh, previously, we relied heavily on written materials. Um, it was not consistent between the clinic. So providers were telling patients some things. Dietitians were, they were telling patients other things. And so we did not have um, an accurate picture of our patient outcomes. Um, and so we wanted it to be consistent across all levels of the clinic. We wanted the curriculum to be accessible to low literacy and low numeracy patients. Therefore, we don't give out any paperwork. It's all done verbally, and we assess if the patients understand using a teach-back method. It is culturally competent, so we used a lot um, of the Stanford's model um, for diabetes education, but the model uses uh, these pictures on the left. Um, they do have a Spanish version, but the foods are not really culturally competent. The majority of our patients don't eat chicken and uh, fried and, and mashed potatoes. So we made our own, which you can see on the right, with 
rice and beans, carne asada, and verduras. Um, another tool that we use, so instead of teaching uh, our patients what diabetes is by showing them, look, this is what uh, arteries look like when you don't have diabetes and when you do have diabetes, we bought these cool uh, glucose wands. Uh, one of the wands is a, contains a less viscous uh, liquid, and they have beads inside which represent uh, red blood cells. And so a normal artery will flow quickly through, uh, through the artery, and the other wand is representative of a diabetic patient with highly viscous uh, blood or liquid, and the beads do not flow easily. And so that was something that the patients were like, wow, that's what happens when I eat all those 10 tortillas in the morning. Um, and then for assessment, uh, we developed a LEMA evaluator tool, which is just evaluating what we taught in the home, like what is diabetes, how is social support important, um, how is stress management important. All of, those, all of those issues are addressed in the first and the last visit for program efficacy and patient outcomes. And then we have a self-efficacy scoring. In the past, we used Likert scales from 1 to 10, and people had no idea what that meant. They're like, so how comfortable do you feel managing your diabetes? Yes. Or no. And we're like, well, we have to use a number because that's what our boss is saying. And so we developed this one, which uses three models or three different ways of assessing how you feel about managing your diabetes. You can use a color, red meaning you don't feel comfortable at all, or green, you feel great. And so that's why we have three models. Uh, we also use the 24-hour diet and physical activity recalls that a lot of dietitians and nutritionists use. However, we found that these are probably not the best tools because we've conducted a lot of home visits on Mondays. Most of our patients are in the food industry, so Mondays, I don't know why restaurants close. Um, we conduct a lot of home visits on Mondays, and they were usually describing the day before, which is a Sunday, which is for a lot of people, rest day, people go to church, there are a lot of church parties, there are a lot of birthdays, baptisms, you name it. So we were getting a very skewed picture of their uh, eating habits and dietary behaviors or physical activity behaviors. Um, so that was a lesson that we learned recently. Um, and just something else that I really wanted to emphasize is we have been able to establish trust in the community, trust in the healthcare system by simply guiding them through the process. You can't just tell, go and see the neurologist. They don't know where to go. And when they go, they may face discrimination, um, not just indirectly or directly. So by having someone to assist them in the continuum of care, it's really helped to establish trust. Um, last year, uh, our GIA program was able to send 1,322 referrals outside of CASA, um, and, they own, and this is six case managers. Six case managers were able to schedule 1,500 appointments outside of CASA with specialty care and primary care. Um, and we really do think that that trusting relationship between the case manager, it's what's driving these interventions. Um, and obviously direct patient advocacy. If you're being discriminated and you have someone there with you, we know and we have experience, so we're able to um, get things done. I look forward for your, to your questions.